too much, but I got to do something. I'm just going to figure it out. What are we finishing here? So we have the fusionist party, and that's where the populists, and the populists were like Democrats. This was a real amazing time. Oops, just give me a second. Not recording. Okay, now so weird. He didn't check. Like, I wrote the report like five times. Like, I was in the game. Yeah. Did I show you this horrible cartoon? Yeah. No. That's where we stop. Right it's pretty close where we stop. <laughs> Okay, so let me add one thing about here. We had this fusionist wave and the populist wave, and I think I added this again. And the effort was to create a multiracial democracy. But you notice know, I have a line through it. Do you see that? The line through is it didn't happen. Now, I'm not saying there weren't bitter disagreements between different groups of people, and I'm still not saying by people weren't dividing each other by their differences. But these were people who were pretty close alike. And there were fusion victories across the South. Populists and it's blocked out, but also Republicans in the South. And the populists were Democrats. They were Democrats, but they had left over the inequalities as it's created. But almost immediately, there's going to be claims of black misrule. That's back to that same thing that happened before. There during Reconstruction. Look what happened. Even though it was not black or white, it was this multiracial, just by United States, which are all kinds of different people. And I think with this, I moved this one here, but here is one of in Wilmington, North Carolina. There'll be a meeting of white men in Wilmington. A full attendance is desired as business in the furtherance of white supremacy will be transacted. There was no doubt what was coming. And it started in North Carolina, but it's going to spread throughout the South. And it's going to be called the Wilmington Insurrection. Oh, almost forgot. And so what's going to happen is white, the Democratic Party is going to start trying to use race to divide the people, just like Bacon's Rebellion. And this was, a, it's, a, it's kind of an amazing cartoon. And so here is an anti-fusionist ticket. And you can see this because it says the fusion ballot box. And you have this monster menacing people. But now I showed you those horrific caricatures like samples, but that's not a sample. That is something else. And it's implying that fusionist is going to lead to black misrule, but something more savage. And it's a shocking cartoon. But it's using race to divide. Bacon's Rebellion thinking again, which should be on the final. I will include that on the list. Thank you. For saying. I, I can't. That's one thing that's so ubiquitous in my mind, I just totally forgot to write it in. Ugh. So, in Wilmington, North Carolina, 1898, there'd be an insurrection. White mobs and their Democrats, they're the Democratic Party, and don't think in terms of anything they stood for, they just recall ourselves Democrats. It's like our team. And they wore red shirts and they go, went through Wilmington attacking anybody they thought would might be a fusionist. Of course, you can imagine blacks are going to be special targets. They lynched, murdered, beat at least 100 people. And this would be given as an excuse for the Democratic governor to send in the brand new National Guard. And they basically overthrew the government and replaced it with a Democratic government. And once that happened, you can see a number of different things. That's going to lead to any attempt at fusionist government will be crushed. Everybody realized after Wilmington will be doomed. And this spread throughout the South. Fusion, 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 I can't say it. Fusion ended. And I'm sorry, this is supposed to say redemption. That's what the final redemption. 
Like, why couldn't it say fusion? So you see by these cartoons, here's a couple things that happened. Uh, let me backtrack. So who got blamed for this? Well, this is the way the papers were. The papers were mostly owned by the wealthier people in the South. Therefore, they were democratic. And so you can see the blacks to blame. Why? Because they were there and they had their government implying that their very presence in the government, good white people, the red shirts had no choice. Here it is from New York and this is a paper that was in Harlem. And so it appealed more to some of the migrants from the South who came up to New York who were black and said, why kills Nagel and seize the town? They knew about this and it just kind of ended it. And after that, you're going to get the establishment of white supremacy in the South. Democratic Party. Now, they didn't do it because of color of skin. They did it for something more insidious, arguably. And we call the laws that they're going to establish, to establish rule based upon color of skin, Jim Crow laws. And these were laws about segregation. And so simply, the Southern policy will be called Jim Crow. And so you hear someone say Jim Crow, it's talking, it's the blanket of all these laws, but the laws people most think about were dividing by race. And don't forget the 14th Amendment. Remember the 14th Amendment? That was supposed to say that everybody was, or their, their bill, uh, rights under the Bill of Rights were protected, their civil rights. But I told you there were two cases from New Orleans that we lumped together as a certain kind of case that said, ah, the states, the 14th Amendment doesn't apply. Do you remember those cases? I told you this yesterday. The case that said the 14th Amendment does not apply to states. Yeah. Yeah, the slaughterhouse case. It actually, about where they put a slaughterhouse and where all the, it's called awful. But no, all the debris from the slaughterhouse where it goes. I'll let you ponder that on your own. And what was the case that said the 14th Amendment doesn't apply to people? One more case. Keep going. United, United States versus what? Yeah, Grisha. And so the 14th Amendment was thrown out, even though that was the intended goal of the 14th Amendment. But remember that this North was kind of tired of it and the South was reestablishing. This was after the fusionist government. I have to be very clear about this. And so we think about Jim Crow law, think about segregation. I'll explain this in just one second. And you see, like, this is a Coca-Cola machine from about 1915. Why don't Why don't Here, uh, movie theater. And that's where the colored section was. On the top, there were seats. And this is a shocking one. Because it'll be a Democratic president will bring Jim Crow to the federal government. And... Here's for U.S. Army officers in Fort Bragg, North Carolina during World War II. And part of the justification for World War II for the United States to be involved is we would claim we are fighting against ultimate racism. And that was for officers, as it would be for enlisted men too. In the United States Army, World War II. And people think, okay, about different facilities, and people would therefore would have Restaurants, they would only be open to whites, and you think, and that's what people think about, you know, buying and selling a product. But it's much more insidious than that. That means that a good portion of the population cannot participate in commerce. The United States is a market economy. The buying and selling of goods are how people create wealth. And what you're telling is a large percentage of the population of but almost all of these states cannot participate in that freely. 
so they can't buy and sell goods. That means it's going to be almost impossible for them to sell products at a profit, to accumulate products to sell, to start a business. They won't be able to do it. They will not be able to participate in the day-to-day -day routines of Congress. That means what's going to happen to a huge percentage of the population of the South? Yeah, they're never going to get out of it. You're going to set an economic underclass permanent by this. And so it's more than just saying you're not going to serve somebody because of their color of skin or whatever it might be in your restaurant. It is about participating in the commercial system. And I should add one more thing before I answer your question. Who sets up the commercial system of the United States? It just happens. It's not natural. Who set it up? Yeah, the United States government. So the United States government is saying, eh, it's okay. Yeah. Um, so good question. And um, Jim Crow was actually a minstrel show. Minstrel show were these shows that were really popular before the Civil War. And it was basically white performers, and they would put black face on, and they would mock blacks, mock slaves, do the, their, their sandals or copies, and they would make fun of them. So Jim, Jim Crow was a clown. And white audiences in the North would love, you know, they might feel kind of that whole thing about racism. They would feel better about themselves because they could laugh at somebody by the color of their skin. And so that's why they called it that. Where it came from, why Jim Crow and why not other ones, is just the popularity of the show. So here's Jim Crow, and that's another mocking Jim Crow. But I can't emphasize this enough. If the United States government allows this to happen, then the United States government, and that doesn't mean just states of the South, that means all of us are participating in that system. If people are not allowed to enter the day-to-day -day commercial lives, and if you do it by color of skin, it almost certainly happened to women. They were not allowed to participate the same way. And it certainly happened to other people of different color of skin or beliefs. It's a big deal. So you might think it's private stores, but it's set up by the United States government. But it also put debt restrictions on. Remember those Jim Crow or the sharecroppers? They were bound to the land unless they pay back their debt. Oh, before they became sharecroppers, what were they called where they had to pay a rent? Yeah, those are the ten apartments. They set up laws saying we will guarantee the contracts that these people sign, desperate people, and they'll be bound to the land. So now you have the force of the law, and they will be arrested if they leave. An arrest is more than what you might just think as an arrest. It's much more than that. And so they're basically going to set up a police state to enforce this. But once again, arrest is much different. There, there were police forces before. There were police forces in the North. The first police forces we know of was created in New York City. I believe I told you why. Do you remember? To stop what? Yeah, the Christmas drunken celebration that used to be in the 1820s, which seems so weird now. But remember, you know, the holidays and the revolution, you know, culture changes. But you're going to enforce this. But don't forget, it's more than just simply arresting somebody or coercing somebody to stay. Now, here's the important thing. Why? Why do this? It again, if you divide everybody else, the, monk, the status quo remains. The status quo remains. And what's the status quo? The people on top stay on top. Gee, could this be like something we've already talked about? The term I keep, I forgot to put on your list. <laughs> Isn't this kind of like Bacon's Rebellion? It happens time after time. So you're going to have people who don't have much, but they could say at least they can use this option. I can use this shot. I must be a little bit. Little things. If you don't have much, a little bit of status means a lot. And every single one of us has probably found a little bit of our status before. 
mean, think about it. you're in this class. Think of the status that brings you. Moving on. So, why is arrest such a big deal? The convict lease system. Remember the 13th Amendment? Prisoners can be enslaved as a punishment for a crime. And so, you have police can pick up for debt restrictions or anything else, but the law that really worked was vagrancy. They could pick you up for vagrancy and then they would rent prisoners. And you know, rent, I should put that quote. They would rent prisoners to employers as cheap labor, or I'm sorry, free labor. And, you know, politicians could rent it to themselves for free labor. The 13th Amendment allows for prisoners to be used as slaves. Yes. What do you think is vagrancy? Good question. What is vagrancy? Does anyone know? Yeah. It's like it's something like wearing the street. Yeah, so Lord of the Street, so not like not having a, a home or not having any, a visible means of, of income. So what who's committing vagrancy? So anybody who's poor, sharecroppers, people maybe what are you just standing on the street corner? Are you a vagrant? They actually had quotas in towns where they would go through and say, you need to pick up this many men. Arrest them. Because we have some work to be done. Anyone could be a baby. So that's so it's basically you have no visible means of support, but see, you're not writing a baby. What if you resist your vagrancy? Oh, we can come up with all kinds of charges. And so then they would lease them out. Mostly young black men. White, poor whites too. I mean, it was anybody. And this was the poor. But by percentage of the population, that was the majority of, of blacks because of the system they have after slavery. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Could they like be sent somewhere else other than the women? They would definitely have to do that kind of work too, but that was mostly for men. So women would be women would be arrested and be forced to be like household help complete for um Really low cost house with hotel. Yeah. Hard, isn't it? You can be arrested time after time after time. I should add that every, uh, oh, I, I jumped the gun, but really hard, isn't it? Is this still legal today? Of course. Now, some states have banned it. Technically, Montana, they can't be worked as slaves. The prisoners are paid virtually nothing, about a quarter of an that's basically true, isn't it? Anyone? So, it's a really kind of awful system. No, it's not the same as slavery. The Jim Crow is horrible. And that's one thing, you know, that's gone. So that's a massive improvement. Yes, there are still problems, but this was unbelievable. And I should add, other people really followed this. The best known is a place called South Africa. This after World War II, they called it apartheid. And people in the United States will look back and they'll say, well, we had our own version of apartheid. And it's that, and they kind of like, we copied South Africa. No, I, other way around. Which is not something you want to be copied for, I would argue. That's my personal bias. So with that, so there's working in Birmingham. That's a chain gain in Arkansas. And so, but there's laws. So that's where voter suppression, all of these are laws. So you suppress the vote. Well, they do. They start, and the big thing is destroy the Republican, I should add, and the populist vote too. I should add that too, the populist vote. The poor black, poor white vote. But think about the percentage of people. <laughs> there are more as a percentage poor blacks and poor whites. And a couple of different ways, terror and violence would of course be used. Now, the big thing is the Klan is basically gone, but there's still going to be the threat of attack, of bodily harm, or arrest. There are stories of people lined up to vote, and all of them would be threatened or arrested for vagrancy. You're not working, and they're lined up to vote. Why not? No one's going to stop them. 
But the probably the most famous example would be legal board's uh, uh, suppression. Mississippi's going to be best known for this. Mississippi did it first, had the second highest percentage of slaves before the Civil War, the second state to secede. But they had their military, uh, the mil military rule ended before South Carolina. And so they started this in the 1880s. But after the fusionist wave died down, all these other states followed it. And there's a number of things they would do. But one of the big thing is the constant claim of voter fraud. And so they have to make voting more difficult because black voters were bribed. I showed you a couple of pictures about black voters being bribed during Reconstruction. So constant voter fraud. They're, they're rigging ballots. That's the way those people are. All you have to do is give them a little bit of whiskey and they'll vote any way you want. Yes, these are very common things. And so if you might have heard calls of voter fraud to this day, this is not a new thing. This is as old as there has been any attempts at this kind of democracy. But another really big one would be called a poll tax. And everybody had to pay this poll tax to vote. Now, the poll tax wasn't that much, but if you're a sharecropper, you have no money. And so who couldn't vote? The poor whites and poor whites. Just couldn't vote. They couldn't pay the tax. It's estimated by about 1910 there were 10 million people who couldn't vote because of the poll tax. They couldn't pay the poll tax. That is now technically unconstitutional. But the important thing here is I don't think the 15th Amendment said there can be no depriving somebody of the vote by. Uh, You can't deprive somebody by color of skin or previous servitude. But everybody had to pay it, so you're not depriving one individual group. But of course, you're benefiting certain people. This was the plan. This would be, eventually, there'd be an amendment to the Supreme Court that would get rid of this in 63. But it still, it still can happen. But the probably the most famous would be the grandfather's clause. There would be a literacy test if your grandfather couldn't vote. Everybody had to take this literacy test if your grandfather couldn't vote. So it doesn't matter what color of skin, it doesn't matter if you are what religion, if you were a slave or not, everybody. So it's equally applied under the 15th Amendment. Everybody has to do it. But just ironically, whose grandfathers couldn't vote? Slaves, exactly right. And so what you're basically saying is you combine this with a poll tax and it's going to be almost impossible for blacks to vote. The literacy test, don't think it turns out like reading and writing. It's your knowledge of government. And it was written in such a way that who could pass this test? Not even educated people. Nobody can pass this test. You will take it next year if you take AP government. You will take the literacy test. I think. Mr. John asked me, I gave him the Alabama one, but I think he's found a couple more, so you can mix them up. And so he always gives us an AP government and nobody passes. And then you're smart, you know your stuff. I know this stuff and I, the first time I took it, I had to get 90%, I think I got like 88%. And I know this stuff. Not that I'm smart, it's just stuff I know, you know, things I'm interested in. But think about it, well, then no one could vote, but remember, your grandfather couldn't vote. It also affected new immigrants too, didn't it? And so this made sure that a lot of people couldn't vote. Now it would be fine. Elements of this we found would, would be found unconstitutional in 1919, but the damage was done. The damage was done. And so here, hat in hand, coming begging to vote, and they always seem to draw Southerners if they're negative, like like uh, Jefferson Davis. At least that's my the way my eyes see it. And here's one last vote. And so that every southern state would adopt some version of this, not just southern states, also the border states like Maryland, Kentucky, Missouri, Kansas had this. Montana had elements of these laws for uh, on reservations. So, so other states aren't immune. I mean, this was, and California did too. Other states did too. 
But one more thing we have to get to. Oh, this isn't the picture I wanted. Did I make a mistake here? I might have made a mistake. Oh, no. Here. Sorry. I, I added something to it. So Homer Plessy was um, basically protesting segregated railroads on the Southern Pacific Railroad. In fact, the Southern Pacific Railroad put him up on this because the Southern Pacific Railroad did not want to pay for separate cars. That was a big expenditure. And so the Southern Pacific Railroad went from New Orleans all the way up to Portland, Maine. And so there weren't segregated cars here and they didn't want to pay for them. So Homer plus he's going to be arrested. And their argument was under the 14th Amendment. Basically, they're going against the Cruchate decision or the uh, slaughterhouse cases. This should be part of their civil rights under the 14th Amendment. And so this made it to the Supreme Court. And this case is a big deal, arguably one of the most important cases in history, because the Supreme Court ruled in a seven to two ruling. OK, what they said is the 14th Amendment applies equal rights. But just they can give equal rights, but they do not have to be the same facility. Thus, separate but equal facilities are constitutional. Now, of course, the reason they're separate, even if they were equal facilities, the reason they're separate is to deprive one group of their civil rights. And so they kind of conveniently ignore that. And so this is a big rule. It has not fully been overturned. It has been mostly overturned in pieces like Brown versus the Beacon, uh, Topeka Board of Education for, um, for schooling. There'd be uh, decisions on graduate schools. There'd be decisions on like public busing, et cetera. But it's, it, they didn't just blanket overturn. It's a big rule. So once you have that, you have set up a system now in the South now with constitutional protection. No one's going to defend the 14th Amendment and now they don't have anything to worry about. And so with that, we have a new South and it's going to be a rule by the elite. And I should have added Democratic Party. They're all Democrats. So I want to be clear about it. the white elite are in charge. And if you're going to run, if you're going to be in any position of power in the South, you have to be a Democrat. Here, there's no Republican. Yeah. Wait, wait, so what part of this South is different? That, the, the new South as in it's different than the South of what the South Basically the same slavery. So I know what you're saying, but they're still, they're technically slavery is over. And so the people are free. There's a new, there's more industrial growth. They had to expand a little bit, but that's actually a really good point because you make the argument, not a heck of a lot different, right? Good point. The net result, over 95% of blacks lost their vote. Between a third and 40% of white voters couldn't vote anymore either. They also rule every Southern state by 1920. And a lot of northern states did this too. If you had a felony, you can't vote. Now, no state allows felony, felons if you're in prison at that moment serving out your sentence to vote. But, mo but states before, and a lot of states still have it, Montana, once you serve your time, you can vote. Southern states, you're a felon, you can never vote for the rest of your life. So your rest for vagrancy, can't vote. And so that further disenfranchises people. But remember, it's everybody applies to everybody who's a felon. States make up the laws. So the difference between a lower case, like called a misdemeanor, depends on who's making the laws. Yeah. So, like during the Civil War, they didn't have any Republicans. If they still have Republicans on the ballot? No. I mean, by, by, uh, by the 1930s, there'd be a Republican on the ballot. 
but they're never going to win. In fact, whoever was the Democratic nominee in virtually every state of the South would win. In fact, let's get to a couple things really quick. I know the bell's about ready to ring, but what it meant is those with money and wealth, their power went up. The planner class, their power went up. Anti-tax, anti-union. Unions were a great uh, way to organize poor people's votes. And so, brought up a very good point here. Oh, this became the kind of genteel elite in every city that put this banner up, the White Citizens Council. But let me add one more thing really quick. Thus, the South will be called the Solid South. And it will be, they will almost always vote Democratic until you see the big shift in 1960. Why the civil rights? When the Democratic Party, Northern Democrats, came for civil rights, came out this period. That's when things were. And so, and it also became very insolent. I mean, it's it's different than the rest of the United States. If you're not going to collect taxes, the education system won't be participated. The roads won't be, but there won't be sidewalks. The water system will not be as good. That's still an issue if you don't think about, like, say, Jackson, Mississippi right now. They're, they're on a boil order again. Down to 600,000 people. All right. I will see you tomorrow. Oh, then we got to get the lynching. Wow. It's a Yeah. I'm going to be gone tomorrow, Friday, Monday.